Welcome to Evolution Greenworks. I'm your host, Lorena Mitchell, and today we have a very special guest. His name is Dr. Barry Prentice, and he's with uh, Bassi Research. Uh, he has a lot of different titles, and I'm going to let him talk to us about how uh, they are doing research and development to northern communities uh, for airships. So I'm going to bring uh, Barry on right now. Welcome, Barry. Oh, well, thank you, Lorena. Nice to be here. Excellent. So tell me, Barry, um, tell me about the history behind Bassi and, and the type of research you're doing in order to, and, and, and why are you doing it too? Uh, those are uh, good questions, short questions with long answers. Yes. Uh, to begin with, uh, I'm a professor in the University of Manitoba, as well as owning uh, or co-founder of, of Bassi, which stands for Buoyant Aircraft Systems International. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I realized that the climate change was real, that, that we were going to see uh, the ice roads disappearing. And I was looking at the, what are we going to do? Because uh, we simply can't afford to build gravel roads, uh, some 2,000 more kilometers in Manitoba and 3,000 in Ontario. And the idea of airships had been around for a long time. I'd certainly been studying this previously and realized that, well, this was the solution. Uh, this is how we could uh, continue to provide uh, service to the north. And not only that, we could improve the service rather than just being a couple of months a year on an ice road. We could deliver goods year round with airships. And the problems in the north, as I started to study this, uh, I realized that they're much worse than uh, we normally uh, would hear about. And they're getting a little more attention now because of COVID and other things. But it isn't just a matter of of the terrible state of housing. About 40% of all the housing is inadequate and probably would be demolished if it were in any city because of the conditions are so bad. Uh, it's also, there's not enough housing. So people are living in these houses because uh, they, they simply have no other place to go. And there's overcrowding. Many of these houses have somebody sleeping in the living room as well as a couple generations in the same house. And of course, we have food insecurity problems. Uh, the cost of food in the north is two and a half to three times what we pay, despite the fact that the government gives out a $103 million a year subsidy to, on transport of food to the north. It's still horribly expensive. So we have that in addition to that, uh, some real health problems uh, with tuberculosis reappearing. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why we need better service to the north. And the airships are an opportunity to do this. Not only are they efficient and effective, but it's a green technology. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that what happened in Churchill also would have been mitigated had there been an airship ship option here for them to get fresh food. Well, what happened in Churchill is really interesting because there was a community that as soon as the rail line went out, went from being what we might consider to be a normal community to a remote community. And there the food prices jumped two and a half to three times. Uh, people lost jobs. Uh, people had to start leaving the community. Uh, and of course that break in the rail line lasted about 18 months or more. So they were in pretty desperate straits by the time the railway came back. But you know, their condition was just the same as some 292 communities in Canada, which have no road access that depend on annual sea lift or winter roads in order to get service. So the conditions that we saw there, uh, yeah, they're, they were very bad for the people in Churchill, but they really highlighted that how much worse all these other communities actually are on a regular basis, including such things as the boiled water uh, issues that you know now are being looked after to some degree, but it's still the conditions in those communities are really bad and there's no reason they should be. You know, the technology exists to have airships. We flew these vehicles 85 years ago. Uh, they would cross oceans on a regular schedule. Uh, the biggest airships, the, the giant Zeppelins, would carry up to 70 tons. And they can make a direct flight all the way from Germany to Rio de Janeiro uh, in one fell swoop. So do that at 80 miles an hour or maybe 145K a day. There's a, an opportunity for us to have a cargo vehicle for the north that would reach any part of the north within about 24 hours, and we could carry loads that would bring in housing and building materials or, or anything that's necessary uh, for life in the north and at a much lower price than being done today. 
That's interesting. Also, wouldn't it be very good northern industry? Um, you know, there's a, there's still a fair number of people up there and communities that would benefit from having, let's say, even a daily airship going back and forth with uh, bringing in supplies to help them create their uh, product or business or it, indeed then bringing it back out to get it to the outside world of Canada because that's the way it feels for these people too you know I mean you have to understand how isolated some of these communities really are uh, it's like living in a, in a different country uh, for what they have right well in some ways it's like a colony on the moon yeah. because if you don't have regular transport you can't have trade if you don't have trade you don't have jobs so really it's a case, uh, the issue in the North is poverty. It's unemployment and very high prices combined. And there's no real future for people. That's uh, the other thing, you know, it's very sad because we see a lot of suicides as well as other social problems in the North. And I think isolation and just lack of, of hope is uh, the biggest issue there. So having an airship that could give regular service uh, would be able to have those communities do things. There's a, there's one, a uh, colleague I have who's interested in trying to develop fish farming in the north. Uh, of course, that means you have to bring the feed in on a regular basis and bring out the fish. So without transportation, that can't be done. But they're looking at a combination of fish farming and, and wild rice production. So create jobs. There's also some forest opportunities and, of course, mining. Now, today, uh, you will notice on the map, you won't find any map mines that are more than probably 50 kilometers away from an established infrastructure. And the reason for that is just simply the cost of getting things out. The only kind of mines you do find that are dealt with by winter roads are either diamonds or gold. And that's because you can bring out the, the, uh, red, the ore <laughs> the, or the gold and diamonds in a Cessna and make that work year round and bring in everything on a winter road in two months. But you can't operate a base metal mine or even a rare earths mine on that basis. So the airships would also allow for employment in the north for people to do things. And then there's another aspect, you know, the, the First Nations, the housing situation is really chronically uh, short. But the people who live there often don't get the jobs to build the houses because they can't get enough work to get qualifications. So if you could bring in airships uh, with materials year round, then people could be trained to be electricians and plumbers and carpenters and, and do things in the north, which today they, you know, we have to bring in those people from the south to build houses, which even adds to the cost. So there's there's many aspects of this which would really be helped by regular and effective uh, transportation. Do you currently have any partners in the northern communities that uh, have been actively helping with your research and development to get the airships off the ground? You know, it's interesting. Uh, it, we haven't had the kind of support that we would hope to get. Uh, you know, the, some people do know about it, but I think they're just so immense, immersed in their own problems that they haven't wanted to look forward very further. And, and in many cases, you know, they look to government to do things because, uh, you know, government has supported their, them for so long. Then in many ways, they look, you know, if government isn't doing it, then they're not going to take the initiative to try and do it themselves. And, and how would they? You know, if they had that initiative, maybe they'd build roads, but uh, they can't do that either. So uh, we don't have the same kind of support in the north that I think we should have, but that may be partly as the function of education and maybe cultural. Uh, I don't know uh, what the real reason is, but certainly there are people who are serving the north, you know, taking and building materials and food and other things that they see the, the rationale and the opportunity for it. But it's, again, a relatively thin market. If you think about the north, how big the country is, 70% of the country has no roads. And so you have maybe 100,000 people living in that area. Well, how can you support an industry based on that thin population so spread out? Uh, it's very, very difficult. And, of course, no company is going to do that by themselves. So this is where the government has to come in. And by and large, the government has been absent. You know, the, I've never yet had a federal politician step to the microphone and say, I like airships. And I think, you know, that, until we, get I think that, we see I think we're seeing some change here, though. Uh, the climate, uh, you know, with the way they want to take a more uh, active approach to the climate change issues, 
uh, by 2030. I, there's, a, there's a fair amount of funding dollars that are going to be coming down the pike here. Are, are you actively working on getting into some of that for research and development? You know, often we fall through the cracks because, you know, they look at roads and other things and things that are, I guess you'd call them safe. But it's really a matter of priorities. You know, the federal government just a couple of weeks ago announced $600 million to fly some few guys around the moon. Well, they got money for that, but they haven't put a penny forward for this topic uh, to develop airships. In fact, the government has no policy on airships. If you look to see like where the, the only policy they have is a regulation that says uh, hydrogen is prohibited in airships. Short of that, they really have nothing. In fact, there's not even in this country. But it's poorly, it's really, poor, it's poorly understood though, isn't it? So I wanted to actually come back after the commercial because I just want to uh, take a take a step away. Uh, Wolf Enterprises, uh, we're going to just take a look at their clip for a minute here. But then when we come back, I want to talk about those challenges. Sure. Excellent. Welcome back. Uh, we're talking with uh, Dr. Barry Prentice here about airships and traveling to the north. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to jump right into is what are the challenges? What's going on uh, in Canada and why is it so hard to put an airship in the air to get some food up north? Well, okay. The first thing you have to understand is that the government owns the sky. You know, they say who can fly, what can fly, where it can fly, how it can fly, where it can land, who can fix it, everything. So if the government's not committed to this topic, nothing can happen. And investors would be very shy about investing in something like this if the government's not supporting it and interested. The second thing is, you know, in history, there's never been a new transportation system that didn't have strong government support and encouragement. You know, the railways have never been built across this country if the government hadn't been behind it. Uh, the locks and the seaway would never have been built without government. The roads would never have been built. The airports would never have been built. None of these transportation systems would have been put in place had the government not supported it. Well, today, we still cannot get the government to pay attention to this. And it's not like we haven't talked to them. And I don't know exactly what the issue is, whether they are too, you know, uh, reluctant to venture into something where, you know, it has a history of, oh, the Hindenburg and so on. But those things happened 85 years ago, you know, and today uh, we see other technologies of that time, which are making a big comeback. Electric cars, for example, were around when the airships were, and they went away and now they're back. Uh, windmills were big at that time. Every prairie farm had a, a little windmill running. Today, uh, they're back big time with uh, wind turbines. Well, why can't airships be back too? And in fact, we know that the technology works. It's not like we have to prove something. It's not an anti-gravity machine. This is a technology that was already proven back, uh, in the, and it actually operated from 1900 to 1937. Most people only know about the Hindenburg. They don't know about the 37 years before that, where the airships were actually quite successful and in fact, the only accident like the Hindenburg was the Hindenburg. There was no other accident like that. You know, so we don't and we shouldn't attribute the loss of the airships to that accident. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it today, you know, two max jets fall out of the sky, killing, you know, 300 people each. Well, the Hindenburg, there were 100 people on board, 66 of them walked away. You know, in today's world, if we had a jet air crash, that 66 people, percent of the people lived, we think it's a miracle. And what really happened with the airship was the Second World War came along. And during the Second World War, aviation took a huge leap forward with, with uh, all kinds of investment in airplanes. And by the end of the war, there were jets. 
and by 1949 was the first jet airliner. Well, the jet airliners killed everything else. They, they killed the transcontinental railways, they killed the ocean liners, the piston airplanes, everything. It was the jet age. And as a result of that, of course, the airships never had a chance because they were only carrying passengers. Today, we want to carry freight. And of course, also in the jet age, nobody cared about pollution. Those jet airplanes kick out a huge amount of carbon. They do. They really do. So what, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is how green this technology is. That's kind of the next thing I want to drop, jump sure. into. And also, what do you think we need to do in order to get the government to listen? Well, that's a good question. On the, I don't know if I have an answer for the second part because I haven't figured that out myself. But on the first one, you know, if we talk about the airship itself, first of all, uh, the lift is constant. So you don't have to pay anything to put it in the sky. All you have to pay for is to push it through the air. And today uh, we're looking at using hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen for the propulsion and also for lift. And if we can do that, we will have zero carbon emissions air transport. There is no other form of air transport that can be as efficient and effective as an airship. It's just simply a matter of physics and costs. So uh, this is where we're going. In fact, we're not alone. I mean, there's a half a dozen or more airship ventures around the world, and they're all looking at hydrogen fuel cells because airships work better with propellers. Obviously, we're only going about 145 kilometers an hour, so the jets don't make any sense. And propeller, uh, electric driven propellers are much better for the north than our, our engines because uh, electric motors don't seem to care about the cold very much. So they run much better. And so it makes sense that a hydrogen fuel cell powered airship is the future. And as I said, zero carbon emissions. Uh, with regard to the government, well, you know, I'm, uh, it's taken a long time eventually they're going to have to recognize this because other places are. Uh, in France, uh, the French government has given about 300 million euros to a company to develop an airship for logging purposes. And that's the very first uh, investment by any government in 85 years in a civilian airship. You know, there's been investment in military airships, but not civilian. And so maybe that will help to... Uh, give the, our government a bit of courage to actually go forward. But, you know, fundamentally, it comes down to this. There is no other solution for the North. And if we want to solve that problem, if we want to solve food insecurity, if we want to give the people there a decent living, there's only one way to do it that's affordable, and that's to use airships. So ultimately, this is going to happen. Uh, and I suppose, you know, the, 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 the carrot for the politicians might be that, Whoever is the politician that embraces airships for the North is going to be like Sir John A. Macdonald embracing the railways for the West, because that's what's needed to bring them into the rest of the country in an economic fashion. Absolutely. And I, and when getting back to the government and what do you think they're afraid of when it comes to, to, you know, using the hydrogen gases versus the helium, um, like, what are the challenges in getting in front of them to prove that with today's technology, with the different things that you're using, and the fact that these ships are planned to be virtually unmanned, I mean, because of the technology we have today, we can do that. Um, well, yeah. Well, you know, they, like, what do you see us years. being able to do with that? Well, you're right. Uh, initially, they'll have to be piloted because you have to teach the computer how to fly them. Correct, but yeah. But, but that's the, the training phase, right? So that's not the planned rollout for it. No, ultimately there'll be drones and uh, they'll operate that way. And, and, you know, we've worked a lot on that topic of drones and, and also uh, a lot of efforts been put into the ground handling. Because again, you have to be able to handle these vehicles on the ground effectively and efficiently and safely uh, to do that. Uh, in the case of the government, I don't know. I, personally, I think they just have not invested the effort to figure it out. And they have not been willing to come forward to try this. And maybe it's the function of the election cycle. You know, if we started today, it would probably be about four to five years before we had an airship that could be certified. Well, politicians are running on a four year cycle. And the other aspect is that, again, politics in this country has become very much focused on urban 
populations. If you can win Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, you don't need the rest of the country. And so a lot of the politics has been focused on urban needs, transit and subways, and millions of dollars poured into there. Although I agree with I do. I do agree with you on that. I just wanted to hold you right there. I've heard a lot of uh, recent, within the last year, talk about trying to make that northern communities open up, especially for medical reasons with COVID um, and, you know, just a vast uh, number of issues, whether it be the food security thing. So it seems like they're starting to at least have the conversation. Well, they are. And, and indeed, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, we shouldn't paint the everybody with the same brush uh, mm -hmm. there are people who are you know serious about uh, doing something and trying to uh, do the right thing uh, unfortunately we just have not found that i mean i talked to mark garneau in july of 2015 uh, personally and said uh, you know we talk about the airships he said oh i know all about the airships they don't need to tell me anything i know all about the airships well he may know about them but he doesn't do anything so here we are five years later and we still have a problem and you know, it becomes a little more acute with something like COVID, where if that gets into these communities, you've got overcrowded housing. A lot of them have already pre-existing conditions of diabetes or tuberculosis. And we've got bad food. We've got lack of any kind of medical treatment. There's no wonder they want to get the vaccines out there first, because those people are really vulnerable and those communities are vulnerable. But they're not vulnerable because of genetics. No. They're vulnerable because of economics. They're vulnerable because we have not paid the enough attention to doing something about it. Well, when an orange costs more than a bag of chips, it, you, <laughs> you start to do the math pretty quickly, right? And they're not, um, a lot of these communities aren't living as traditional, I think, as they would like to be, um, which would also be more inherent to them uh, living more healthy. Um, but like I said, if the store all the light white things are, are the cheaper option. I mean, it gets really difficult to choose good food anyway. So food insecurity, I think, is number one. But but creating industry and allowing for business to, to, to become business and to do business with the rest of Canada, like um, other Canadians are um, free to do, um, you know, without the challenges that are in place, I, I think it would normalize the communities and you wouldn't see the healthcare um, problems that you do right now. I agree with you completely. I mean, fundamentally, it's poverty. Uh, yes. That's the problem. But the poverty, you have to go back and say, well, why are they poor? Well, they're poor because they don't have jobs. Well, they don't have jobs because they don't have trade. Well, they don't have trade because they don't have transport. We it all comes to transport. Come transport. That's, that's what I'm saying. The core oh. is always transport. If we can normalize the community with transport, then we've normalized and solidified the food insecurities. We've created jobs and industry because let's say, you know, face it, there are some beautiful prime territory up there for businesses to be created and or they might even be created right now. It's just way more challenging for them. Um, but you know what I mean? And then that gives us jobs. And I think that creates less poverty. People are working. People are happier. They feel more vested in their communities and in themselves. Therefore, ergo, their health would then be um, much, much better. Uh, Lorraine, I think one thing we should clarify, though, you know, because people talk about the North, they get this idea we're talking about Baffin Island and Ellesmere Island. No, we're, we're talking about just northern Manitoba and yes. northern Ontario. We're talking about, I'm here in Winnipeg. We're talking about places that are no more than 250 kilometers north of us. As soon as the roads stop, you go from being what we consider to be a modern society to Pretty a third past world country Thompson, or worse. Right? So Pretty much past Thompson, right? So, I mean, anything you know, on the east side of Lake Winnipeg, yeah. uh, anything north of Pickle Lake, you know, you, the, the whole of northern Ontario and, and much of uh, Quebec. So, you know, this is an area where we can reach this. I mean, it's not like uh, this can't be done. And it also isn't like it's that expensive. I mean, if you look at the comparables, and I, I'm an economist, so I do this. You know, the cost of building a gravel road in the, in the shield of the Arctic is about $3 million per kilometer for a gravel road. So, you know, how many kilometers do you get for $100 million? 33. Well, that isn't going to do very much for the north, but with $100 million, you could start the whole airship industry. You know, yes, so it's yeah. not a case of, 
of the money per se. And again, they've got $600 million to send a man around the moon. You know, like they don't have any money to send uh, an airship to Baker Lake. Like what's wrong with this I'll picture? Think, I think they need to get Canada running smoothly before we start talking about the moon. <laughs> well, and it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy when you think that it's probably easier to get to the moon than it is to have regular transportation to northern Manitoba. And that is the reality. Well, really. when, you're, when your transport minister is a former astronaut, you know, he's got dazzling things in the sky for him are more interesting than yep. things here on Earth. I mean, we got real practical problems right here on Earth yep. and we have to deal with them. So, you know, we, we need to get people who are focused on this and, and people who really want to have a policy that is going to help people in the North and not just Band-Aids. You know, I've heard so many times, you know, people say, oh, we just educate everybody. Well, you educate everybody's great, but if there's no jobs, what are they going to do? The only way they can benefit is to get out of their community. So unless we want to depopulate the North, education is not going to be a solution. And, you know, a lot I of- I don't think the answer is to depopulate. These people, this is their 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 history and their, their traditions. And this is their way of life that's up there. But the blend, unfortunately, they can't have the way it used to be. Well, so, the thing is, yeah, they, they don't want to leave. Their ancestors are buried there. They grew up so, there. They love the North and they want to stay there. And they should. Uh, on top of that, you know, from a Canadian perspective, if we depopulated the North, what claim do we have to that territory? You know, we might as well just uh, put up a big sign and say, welcome, China. You know, you, we're not using it. Why don't you? You know, yeah. so if we're They'd not... They'd find a way very quickly. <laughs> I'm sure they would. They'd there is an awful there. lot of resources up there. Well, um, one of the things I did want to ask you, uh, and, and I'm going to tackle this after after the break, I'm just going to go to um, one of our sponsors, Piranata, does uh, all natural makeup. I'm just going to flip to a, a quick commercial break for them. And then I just wanted to answer the question, how does the cold affect the airship? So if we want to think about that for a minute, I'll see yeah. you in a second. Hey, and we're back. That was just a short one. So welcome back. Dr. Barry Prentice was going to uh, then elaborate on how does the cold affect airships? Well, there's two kinds of airships uh, and, and, and it affects them differently because uh, the one is a pressurized gas bag. You know, the, the Goodyear blimp is a good example of that. And it's kept its shape by the pressure of the gas inside the, the, the hull. Well, if you have cold weather, of course, the cold shrinks the gas. So if you have a wide variation in your temperatures, which we do here, you know, we can go from uh, 20 degrees Celsius change in 12 hours. So at one point, your airship might be just fine. And then 12 hours later, it's so saggy that you can't fly it. Well, that's not going to work. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, and we did a lot of research on this, we built our own blimp and our own uh, research facility and tested it during the cold. It's not possible to do this in an effective manner. So the blimps are out. It has to be a rigid airship like the old Zeppelins. Uh, the difference there is that you have a frame that keeps the shape of the airship and you have a bunch of gas cells inside, maybe 10 or 12 of them. Well, if they shrink in the cold, it doesn't hurt them because as the air gets colder, it gets thicker and you're just displacing the air for your lift. So the temperature doesn't affect your lift very much in, an, in a rigid airship but it is uh, not possible in a blimp. So as far as the other aspects, uh, airplanes have problems with icing and snow because they need aerodynamic lift. In an airship, the only issue is weight. And if the snow and ice accumulates on the top of the airship, well, you could have a problem. Our solution is to have a thin solar panel on the top of the airship because they get warm in the sun and, and it'll melt any snow or ice that'll be up there. So we don't really think there's too many problems with the with the cold. Again, we want to go to electric motors because they work better in the cold. And of course, we're designing the airship so that everything can be done with gloves on. Uh, you know, if you have to take your glove off to turn a little nut 40 below, uh, it's going to be difficult. So we're actually designing our airship with cold in mind. So it will operate in the, uh, the, so end of the winter. So let me ask you then, is it planned for it to say, be able to go from Winnipeg to Gillum? 
or no. is there going to be have to be pit stops along the way for it to um, recharge? No, it, it, there's no need for any stopping. You could fly all the way from Winnipeg to Iqaluit. Uh, it's a question really of the size of the airship and the economics. Uh, the longer the distance, the bigger the airship you need because of the amount of freight you can carry on per cycle. I use the analogy of uh, a pickup truck. You know, I can make money delivering freight around Winnipeg in a pickup truck. I'll never make money taking freight from Winnipeg to Toronto in a pickup truck. So it's really a case of the bigger, the longer the distance, the bigger the airship has to be. But with a 30 ton lift airship, which is what we have as our first uh, model, we could serve all of Northwestern Ontario and Northern Manitoba from jump off points like Thompson or Pickle Lake or Red Lake or any of these uh, traditional locations. Cause typically you'll move everything as far as you can on the roads with truck. Then you transfer to the airship and it goes off where you don't have roads. Well, perfect, Barry. Uh, it's been really exciting talking to you today and, and letting uh, Manitobans and Canadians know a little bit more about the value of airships and the research and development that you're doing. I'd just like to part with one more thing. Where do you where do you feel in the next five years you guys are going with this research? Do you think that you're going to be able to get back into a working model? Well, we have uh, not quit. Uh, we lost our hangar in a, in a very difficult storm in 2015. Since that time, we focused all our efforts on the gas cells, and we have a research facility in Ontario to do that. Uh, we're looking at using hydrogen again. So in order to use hydrogen, we have to have safety in mind, and obviously we've got materials now that will hold hydrogen, and you can seam them so they'll hold hydrogen, which is actually a big breakthrough for us as well. And we know that we can operate safely with hydrogen as lift. This is one of the issues that's also been a problem, I think, with the airships is investor confidence. If you have to use helium, there's always a worry. Well, you know, it's a finite gas. Is there enough of it? We get this investment going and then all of a sudden there isn't helium or whatever. Well, if you have hydrogen, it's endless. And we all know that in this green industry that you can make hydrogen out of so many different ways. So, we do. It's almost as abundant as as uh, carbon, really. Uh, absolutely. Um, more abundant. And more abundant, so, yeah. So, you know, hydrogen is the key. And uh, as far as us uh, going, you know, this is going to happen in other parts of the world as well as Canada. And, you know, even if the government here needs to be drawn in, kicking and screaming into the 21st century, it's going to happen because there isn't another solution. I just wish that you know we would get more support and we could do that here in a place like Manitoba where we could create jobs building airships. It isn't just the North that's gonna benefit from this technology. There's gonna be a lot of good jobs created building airships and flying airships and, and using airships. And also, you know, in the longer picture, uh, as the airships get big enough, they'll cross oceans again. And we can replace those carbon burning jet airplanes, which are just carrying cargo. Uh, there's very little cargo has to travel at 500 miles an hour, notwithstanding a liver transplant. So, you know, if you have an airship that would cross the Pacific Ocean in four days, uh, cross the Atlantic in two days, that's plenty fast enough for any air cargo. And so we could actually uh, very much improve the environment just by replacing uh, jet airplanes with airships. On the passenger side, you know, I think we'll still use jet airplanes for a long time. And we don't have to get rid of all the carbon. You know, we just have to reduce the amount of carbon we're using. And we can reduce other places easier, like heating and other things, and still use the uh, jet fuel uh, so we can get around in a, in a speedy fashion, which is useful. Would you, would you please uh, talk to us a little bit about how would you create this hydrogen gas that you would want to be using with the airships? Well, there's a bunch of ways. Uh, obviously, electrolysis could be used uh, with uh, solar power or with wind turbines. That would be a nice green technology. A lot of the hydrogen today is stripped off of methane, which is called blue, uh, techn uh, blue hydrogen, and that's not as good. But there is a new technology which is coming in, and people might want to look into this, a company called Proton Technologies out of Alberta. And they've developed a method of pushing oxygen down at the old oil wells, and lo and behold, hydrogen comes back up. So this is a very promising technology, could actually uh, reinvigorate 
uh, the Alberta oil industry to not be producing oil, but to be producing hydrogen and also sequester the, the carbon at the same time. It's a really tremendous breakthrough. I'd encourage anyone to have a look at it. And I think this is maybe the future. They've I, also done a pilot for those old well holes uh, yeah. for using it for the um, um, geothermal potential of them. So uh, I know there was a test project that was off the ground and it was yielding some really interesting first results for well, heating the, buildings. This company has a, a test well in Saskatchewan where they're producing hydrogen right now. One of the biggest problems is transporting hydrogen is how do you move it around efficiently and effectively? You know, because it, it is a gas. Uh, you Right now it's moved a lot in what we call tube trucks or tube trailers and, you know, high pressurized uh, tubes or you can use cryogenic systems to uh, carry it as a, a liquid form, but that's a lot of energy to get both create the liquid and then you have to deliquefy it. Wouldn't it be easier to do a hydrogen plant with fuel cells? Well, you can do that too, and you can produce electricity from right at the well head, uh, but and then produce uh, and ship uh, electricity in a grid. That's quite possible. Uh, but then again, you know, you're not using hydrogen in the same way because there's some real advantages to hydrogen. You know, mm -hmm. it, in mobile vehicles, for example, it's the refilling time that's an issue. Uh, with a hydrogen fuel cell uh, forklift, for example, you can refill that in five minutes just like you'd any other kind of liquid fuel. Whereas uh, if you're charging a battery, that's a five or six hour process. So in terms of, of utilization of the transport equipment, hydrogen's a much better fuel. And you know, electrical things have their strengths and, and hydrogen has its strengths. We'll use all these together. But I think the, the key is obviously to produce the hydrogen in a fashion that doesn't create carbon emissions itself. And, uh, you know, we've got to look to those forms which uh, are coming on stream. Very good. Um, and where can people find out more information about your research, Dr. Prentice? Well, the, the, you do have below the Chiron, I see our website, so you can uh, go to our website directly. Also, there's a not-for-profit entity that we've created called Isopolar. And Isopolar has got a, a blog with lots of information on it about airships in general. It's not a commercial uh, enterprise. It's just there for good information. But there is a, a lot of information on the internet. Some of it's a bit, uh, you know, questionable at times as uh, things on the internet sometimes are. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are some legitimate companies uh, that are involved in doing this. It's really only a matter of time. Uh, what I'd encourage people who are listening to this today Ask your politician, why are we not looking at airships for the North? Just ask that simple question. Yes. And let's, if enough people ask the question, maybe sooner or later they, they'll wake up in Ottawa and we'll get some results. Well, we keep hearing uh, uh, the, the, the catchphrase is that they're, they're trying to address the transportation to the North. And we're also talking about the food security issues for the North. Um, but they never seem to have an answer for that. They just seem to keep talking about it. I think it's time to say, whoa, what is the solution? Let's, let's have the top three solutions and let's talk about the costs of those solutions and developing them. I think we have to push for that as Canadians because right now it's almost like we're a third world com uh, country up top, uh, you know, and that's anything, you know, north of the populated areas. It doesn't take like 200 kilometers and out of, outside of any major city here towards the north and you're into a community that is fly-in only usually. Well, the issue is really it's a public problem. You know, it, the government's responsible for the First Nations in the north. It's not a, a private sector problem. It's not some big corporation's problem. And there's no big opportunity for a big corporation to jump in and do this. So if the government doesn't lead the way, it, nothing's going to happen. And, you know, they also, as I said, they control the skies and the, all the regulations. There has to be work done by the government on this because they have a role to play. They can't be just a passive observer. You know, we always say about transportation that it's a joint public-private enterprise. You know, it's not like the furniture industry where there's no role for government in furniture. You know, the, the, the furniture is produced and everything's fine. But in transport, it's different because you have joint use of things like roads and airports and ports. So the government has to be involved in order to provide that infrastructure. 
And similarly with airships, there is a need for landing facilities. There is a need for a certain amount of, of hangars that could be used like dry docks. So there is a role for government in this. And if they don't accept the role, or if but they don't- primarily, But primarily the infrastructure is there already up north, right? They already have small airports that should be, in theory, good enough for an airship to land, I we, would think. Yes, you could land there, but an airship lands vertically. We don't right? need a landing strip. And what we do need, though, is a turntable, because that's the approach that we think, because oh. once you're on the ground, if the wind changes, the airship's going to move. It's like a big sail. You can't hold it sideways. It has to always have the nose into the wind, which is why most of the times when you see an airship at a mast, you know, it's weather veining. So it's there on the mast. Well, that's okay for a small blimp, you know, a few advertising things. But it's not good for cargo because you have to be able to hold this thing steady so that people can put cargo on and off and refuel and so on. And you can't do that just out in an open field. You have to have a certain amount of preparation at the base. Plus, you need water at the base. Because if you take off 30 tons of freight and you don't put anything back on, next stop's on the way to Mars. You know, you, you've got a constant yeah. lift. So you have to put 30 tons of something on, and the best thing to put on is water if you don't have freight. So you have to have a, a store of water to exchange for the cargo when you land. And so this needs a certain amount of preparation. The picture behind us, you know, you can see the airship. That's sitting on a turntable. Yeah, That's as we close out, I'm going to let our viewers see that picture uh, so that they can get to take a closer look at what the rendition should be. Um, now, you mentioned something about um, rigid versus uh, non-rigid airships, and I think that's part of what you were saying with the turntable problem as well, right? Um, I guess my question is, if it was rigid the way, and you say 30 tons is like a projected amount of freight that could be carried, is that carried underneath? Is that like a have to be balanced uh, throughout the whole underneath? Well, again, this is the advantage. The advantage of a rigid airship is you have a metal frame, so you can spread the weight out better, and therefore you can have a point load in the middle. Because again, with an airship, is like a ship of the ocean. Your center of gravity should be at the bottom, and you want this thing balanced so you fly straight. So you want to put the load in the middle, which is where it should be. And of course, in the case of an airship, they're so big that you can have a very big cargo bay. I mean, we always say that in an airship. The only limit on freight is weight. So you can carry very bulky, low uh, density things. Uh, in the north, most people don't realize this, but two of the most expensive things per pound in the north are Cheerios and baby uh, diapers. And you know, it's because they're bulky. You, an airplane doesn't, uh, once you get the airplane filled, that's it, the door closes and off you go. You, you don't get anything more on. Well, an airship is so big that you have lots of space for that. And you can also have slung loads. Again, they're very big. You could carry a house below the airship without any problem aerodynamically because wow. you don't need that You could area. actually take housing already done Literally, up you could there. Take, you could take prefab housing. Whoa. And That's down. a game changer. That's a game changer in a community that has a lot of... Uh, well, traditionally, a lot of difficulty with good housing, number one, but also housing in general. Like, there's such a shortage up there that they literally have multiple families living in the same, like, thousand square feet. I don't think anybody here can appreciate that there's just no housing. Yeah, it, it's, again, uh, people would be shocked. I mean, we would never, I mean, there are houses that should be condemned and, and, and probably would be condemned, uh, that people are living in, they have mold in the walls, which is really bad because you get these uh, 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 problems of breathing with these molds. They're, they're actually very dangerous for you, but they're there because they got no choice. Well, it isn't you know just housing. Imagine uh, an airship, because it's so big, you could easily carry a wind turbine blade under it. So you could actually have wind turbines in the north also as opposed to bringing in fuel and running generators, uh, as well as moving the wind turbines around here on the prairies. I mean, so the people aware. building the uh, the housing, they're actually interested in the airships too, because it's hard to get a, a vehicle uh, to move housing around. But prefab housing in, in a factory is about a third the cost of building it out in a lot. 
because you can just be so much more efficient building in a factory than you can uh, stick building out in the in the wild and in the weather. So there's a lot of advantages and things that we'll do. I think when the airship industry finally arrives, and you know, I hope it arrives in my lifetime, but you know, when it does arrive, people are going to be amazed at the sort of things that are being done and that today we just don't even think about because, well, it's not possible. Uh, for example, the longest wind turbine blade you can get down the road is about 100 foot long. Whereas if you have in, uh, installations on the coast, they use 200 foot blades and they get four times the power for the same location. Well, they'd like to do that inland, but they just can't get the blade down the road. So an airship could do that and make the whole wind turbine or wind industry much more efficient as well. So there's all kinds of things that are there. In fact, I'm very optimistic coming out of this pandemic that we're going to see a lot of positive changes. And part of it's because, you know, I think in the midst of the pandemic, people have become feeling more vulnerable. You know, we're not so brave that we're, <laughs> we're out there. We got this invisible enemy out there, but I think it's also made us more sensitive to the risk of climate change because yes. we know that the risk is coming it seems like it's a long way out but today it's become a lot more in our face and as a result of that you well, know, it's, government is it is actually on. mother nature right it's the evolution of new viruses that come to play i think people are understanding that there's a lot more not in their control versus what is in their control so that's where the vulnerability comes i believe yeah, and, and I think because of that, we're, we're more willing and open to look at new ideas. Maybe the politicians don't have to be so afraid of airships. They can be a little more bold because the public likes this idea. I mean, I am approached all the time by people asking, well, why don't we have these airships up north already? You know, it's, it's they're ready for it. Uh, this is a popular idea. And sooner or later, one of the political parties are going to grab it, and then we'll start to move forward because, again, it's not like I'm some kind of a socialist that thinks the government has to do everything. But there's some areas where government has a role that it must play. And transportation is one of those. It simply cannot try to uh, abandon its obligations and assume that the private sector is going to do everything because they won't. It won't. Yeah. I think we can close on that uh, where really we need government to step up to help this uh, become an industry that can open the north and create a better life for the northern communities, not just of Manitoba, but clearly across Canada. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Barry Prentice for joining us today and, and sharing his years of hard work um, in his belief that transportation can solve those problems and his his industry of, of bringing these airships forward. It's old, but new, but <laughs> wow, we need to get back with it, right? Everything old is new again. Absolutely. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prentice. And uh, you have a uh, happy holidays. And thank, thank you for joining you. us. Bye now. It was a real pleasure. Bye for now. Thank you. Well, that was just a fantastic episode of uh, talking to Barry Prentice with uh, Bassi Research. Um, Dr. Barry Prentice has been doing this research for quite some time, so I was very happy to be able to bring this to our evolutionaries out there who are learning and understanding how they can play their role in helping uh, the environment. I'm going to close this with a picture of the airship that is proposed. They have. Uh, done soft airships in their R&D, but this is more like the rendition of what it will look like. And I just wanted to say happy holidays from Evolution Greenworks. Thank you.